Thomas is like all of us, a watch enthusiast, but with one exception. He is without a doubt one of the most dedicated subscribers and audience members in our community. Whether I make a video, host a live stream, watch other channels' videos or discussions, he is always there, either leaving insightful comments or sending in donations. He is such a stand-up guy. Just as one example, he took all of the photos you will be seeing himself, even going to the lengths of changing out his shirts to match the colors and aesthetics of the watches. So you're all in for a treat. We had discussed a collection review last year, and now it's time to put his current pieces in the limelight. Frankly, they are as humble as the man himself, and of course, we'll have some fun looking into watches that we could add to the collection at the end. First, a 1950s Omega Seamaster on a beads of rice bracelet. He inherited this watch about 20 years ago. I had been into watches since I was about 15, but this was the first dressy style watch that I got to own. It's about 33, 34 millimeters wide, and with its Explorer type dial, and being a time only piece, feels quite dressy and quite timeless. This is not only a beautiful example of a 50s era Seamaster, but also a model still in superb condition, as with all of his pieces. And at this point in time, a collectible. I know dealers in London who would pay a pretty penny for this example. Also, this model has been recently reproduced by Omega in the 1948 Seamaster 70th Anniversary Collection. The Beads of Rice bracelet also really tops off this model. Gorgeous watch. Next, the Rolex Submariner Kermit, reference 16610 LV. This was the first Rolex that he ever bought. I got it in 2010 to celebrate getting a new job. It had been in a shop window of a jeweler's for a good few months and had just been discontinued. I knew that the sub was Rolex's signature piece and, like the green bezel, not realizing its significance as an anniversary edition until later. And Thomas chose wisely. A. This is one of the most sought-after Submariner references. B. It was one of the last five-digit references before the transition to the supercase variants. And what makes it unique, apart from the green bezel insert, is that it uses a modern maxi dial. Some might call it a Frankenstein of the neo-vintage references, with a classic case, bracelet, but modern movement and dial. But it is very exciting. Of the green Submariner variants, this model I find the most engaging. The use of green is not overstated. The color is not muted or flashy. The contrast between the green and black is striking. It makes for an excellent example of a Submariner and pairs nicely with the other Rolex in his collection. Next up, the Panerai Luminor Marina 1950, known as the PAM 352 all titanium with titanium bracelet. This one I bought in 2011 when I kept going to a newly appointed Panerai dealer and was totally sucked in by the big watch thing. This model was the only titanium model, basically the only one in the shop with a bracelet that was light enough to wear. I loved the tobacco colored sandwich dial. This is the watch that I wear the most and it has been through the wars with him. As far as Panerais go, we seldom see them on bracelets. It is very seldom we do see them in titanium. We can all agree that this is a watch that epitomizes what makes up the characteristics of Panerai divers. A huge case and dial, a trademarked crown guard, one of the first crown guards ever used on a watch by the way. It really looks like an instrument that deserves to be strapped over a wetsuit and used in the water. It keeps all of its 50s charms while still showing off interesting choices, like for example, Notice the large crown guard on the right, and to counter that visual heaviness, the sub-seconds are lined up next to the nine numeral. The watch also looks so much more integrated with a bracelet, a lot more toned down and apart from its size, probably wouldn't attract much attention because of the neutrality on the metal surfaces. Love the rounded aesthetic that follows throughout the bracelet and how it flows into the case. Next, a real heavy hitter and a watch that punches way above its weight, the Rolex Z Blue Milgauss, reference 116400 GV. He bought it in 2018. I was just in love with the amazing dial since it was released, and one day I walked past my authorized dealer and saw it in the window with its stickers on still looking amazing. It is probably my favorite watch, though being a time-only piece and having such a shimmering dial. The combination of colors really is top-notch. I've spent a lot of time discussing the quirkiness of this piece, and we'll link to two videos in the corner of the screen. First, explaining why the Z Blue Milgauss is so polarizing, excuse the pun, and second, 
looks at the development of the Milgauss line over the years. I called it something like the Einstein Rolex. It is the blend of fun and formality. How could you possibly pull off a combination of green glass with a rhodium blue dial and a bright orange lightning bolt second hand? No idea, but the execution is brilliant. Last but not least, the Omega Seamaster 120 meter Baby Proplof, the latest addition to his collection. A model introduced by Omega in the 1970s as a semi-professional alternative to the Ploprof 600. This model is new old stock, doesn't have an original Bakelite bezel or patina on the dial or hands. And it really epitomizes the 70s aesthetic in every way. Whether we look at the case, the mesh bracelet, the orange minute hand, What's interesting is that even though it's considered a baby Ploprof, it still looks fantastic on the wrist. And that is in part due to the sheer presence of the mesh bracelet. Its 20mm width makes it look well balanced and the proportions are top notch. And just look at the condition of it. Stunning. He has been searching high and low for a very specific Seiko, a watch given to pilots in the 80s and 90s known as the reference 7A287120 G1. I'll link the reference on the screen. It is a model that was covered in the Watches of the Armed Forces video that you will also see in the corner of the screen now. He had this piece as a teenager. He bought it off a friend who pinched it from his dad, who was a pilot in the services, as all great stories go. So if anyone has this model or knows where one is available, comment about it below. Overall, we see a humble but exciting set of pieces. All of them make for a set of very understated choices perfect for everyday wear. And from this collection, we can see a few notable things. Many of his references have a use of highlights, like the orange hand of the Milgauss and the orange hand of the Ploprof. Just that alone offers an opportunity for a piece that we probably all would agree would sit perfectly in his collection. He enjoys bracelets on watches, using them over leather straps, but maybe we can introduce something else to the lineup and convert him in a way. We have chatted at length about watch buying decisions and Thomas is always open to trying new pieces, as we all are. Now what could we add? What can we see that is missing? Let's have some fun. I threw a few ideas together quickly and of course these suggestions are to be taken lightly, merely as considerations, but I would want to see the collection spiced up a bit. What would I like to see? A chronograph and a dress watch in there somewhere. How could you afford some of these watches? My suggestion would be to sell the Kermit Submariner, possibly, because it has virtually doubled in value since you bought it. This might not sit well with you, Thomas. Just a wild suggestion to get access to some very available funds. For a start, let's look at chronographs. Here I've put together a series of Omega Speedmasters. Not the typical professional variants, but ones with more edginess to them. The first Omega in space and the reference CK2988. They are all very striking. I personally think the Panda variants are extremely attractive. They are modern, insanely legible as chronographs, but also look to be models inspired by 60s motifs. The use of highlights on the dial. The use of the pulsation scale on the bezel is also a nice and practical touch. They just add an excellent combination of contrasting colors to the family. We could also consider looking at models like the Breguet Type 20 as a model that speaks more to the higher end of the brand spectrum. Then moving to the possibilities of dress watches. The one model that we have discussed in the past is the Vacheron Constantin Historique Americaine 1921. Utterly sublime. The reason why I think it would suit your collection so well is that it adopts the cushion case aesthetic that both your Panerai and Baby Ploprof has. It also is very unique in the watch world, offering a great amount of wrist presence, stunning use of Breguet hands and numerals. It doesn't need to be sold to you or to any enthusiast, honestly. It's just a true milestone watch for anyone. Next, we could possibly look into the Reverso family, finding you a duo face with an interesting color scheme like blue. Maybe we could look into a model like the Tribute to 1931 with an all black tuxedo look. Or we could look closer into Breguet, finding you a purely simple classique. My personal favorite is the Retrograde Seconds. Gorgeous balance on the dial. And it's always a pleasure seeing a power reserve on a manually wound watch. But to top it off, the one watch that I believe would sit perfectly in your collection is as follows. It needs to be rugged. It needs to have a larger than 40 mm size for your wrist. It needs to have a highlight, a spot color, and a very practical complication that you could use daily.
My number one suggestion out of all of these models is the new Rolex Explorer 2, reference 216570, either in polar white or black. If it was me replacing my Kermit with a more modern example, while still getting some money to keep on the side, I'd be opting for this reference. It's bold, it's fun, practical, doesn't look like a Rolex to the casual observer, and would pair so nicely with the bizarre and exciting Z-Blue Milgauss of yours. In the end, this was just a thought exercise. The watches in this final frame shows a selection of a few notable pieces that would make for a stellar and interesting collection. Some Rolex, some Omega, a Panerai, a Vacheron. The watches all display a clear character and highlight what ties them to their respective brands, which is also something to take in. Whether we're looking at the form or the function of the piece, Rolex has a superb GMT movement, Omega with its coveted chronograph, Panerai with their big, brash divers, or Vacheron with their elegance and restraint. I hope you all enjoyed the talk. It was a lot of fun to put together, and we should all take the time to congratulate Thomas for his achievements and sharing his pieces with us. I think what makes these collection reviews interesting is that we get to share our perspectives on the subject differently. From that, we can gauge and understand where we're all coming from, and in the end, possibly make a much more interesting buying experience. Share your thoughts on this collection, share thoughts on other watches that you might have seen that you find interesting, and let's focus the comments on Thomas's collection, what we could add, what we could subtract, and where the collection could go from here. Until the next one, see you then.